Well, hey there. You know, a common accusation against Israel these days is that it is a apartheid or racist state. Well, if that's true, how could Christians support Israel? Because we can't support racism. So it's a very important issue, and I want to give you the answers. So stick with me. Welcome to the Israel Answers series, connecting Israel, the Bible, and you. Join Susan Michael as she explores timely issues and current events from a scriptural perspective to equip the Christian world with a balanced and biblical response. Be sure to subscribe for future episodes, which will ignite your faith and bring the Bible to life in your everyday world. Now, let's join Susan with your Israel Answers. You know, Amnesty International just issued a report accusing Israel of being an apartheid state. Now, many people have expressed outrage against this biased report. Even some leaders inside Amnesty have admitted that it was very short-sighted. Nevertheless, we need to talk today, what is an apartheid state, and is this something that Israel is guilty of? Well, the word apartheid comes from the Afrikaans language spoken in South Africa, and it means separateness or apartness. And it is describing a legal system that once ruled in South Africa in which the white minority government had legally um, imposed separation of the races and outright discrimination. Um, there was significant international outrage against this, and finally there were boycotts and there were sanctions, and it brought the government down. And in 1994, Nelson Mandela became the first black president of South Africa. Now, the apartheid regime in South Africa needed to be dismantled. It was a minority white government legalizing racial separation and discrimination of the majority black population in South Africa. The blacks could not enter white areas without permits. They couldn't own property. They couldn't study in, in mixed schools. It only could be in black schools. And there, they were actually intentionally um, given less education. And um, so it was uh, outright legal discrimination and racism, and, and uh, it needed to be brought to an end. But the accusation of apartheid against Israel is just absolutely not true. And uh, before I give you the facts about Israel that are really going to refute this, I want to take a few minutes just to talk about, well, if it's not true, then why are they making this accusation? I mean, right? Where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, not always. There are such things as smoke machines. So let me get back to the subject. There is um, a few reasons I want to go over here about why this accusation keeps coming around and coming back around. And first is the accusation is actually anti-Semitic. So classic anti-Semitism throughout the centuries really blamed the Jewish individual for the ills of the world and uh, kept the Jewish individual from being a full member of the human race, basically. Today, there's a new form of anti-Semitism, and it actually is keeping the Jewish state from being accepted amongst all the states of the world. So it's the Jewish collective that is being discriminated against here. And that's why this accusation really oftentimes is coming from a position of anti-Semitism. Now, um, the enemies of Israel found that this accusation of being an apartheid state was actually very useful because if the South African regime had been dismantled because of this, if they used the same accusation and painted Israel as an apartheid state, Israel too could be dismantled. And that's what is really behind this campaign. It's about bringing Israel as a Jewish state to an end. Now, this new form of anti-Semitism that is focusing on the Jewish collective, the Jewish state, 
It's a political expression of anti-Semitism. It, uh, we call it anti-Zionism. And the anti-Zionism campaign um, calls for the delegitimization of Israel, um, the demonization of Israel, making it to look actually evil, and then uh, to boycott and sanction this evil state in order to bring it to an end, to dismantle it. That's really what the campaign of anti-Zionism is all about. And um, so I just want to say that the accusation, this global campaign against Israel, implying that Israel is an apartheid state, it's not just propaganda. It's not just something that we can say, oh, that's just not true and ignore it. It's a very dangerous campaign, because if they can succeed in making Israel look so bad that the international community believes they need to take action, uh, it could really be very damaging to the future of the Jewish state. Now, we see this anti-Zionism campaign in the halls of the United Nations, amongst the other international bodies, um, here amongst left-wing um, organizations, and we see it on our college campuses. So every March on college campuses all around the world, there is what's called Israeli Apartheid Week, and it's a week to protest Israeli apartheid. And this week is so anti-Israel, it's anti-Semitic. Many Jewish students stay out of the way during Apartheid Week. They don't want to be seen because they don't want to be attacked. It's a dangerous anti-Semitic movement, and there is a Palestinian organization that's behind it. There's a lot we could talk about there, and maybe in a future episode we will. But for today's discussion, I just want to give you an overview of why there is a concerted campaign against Israel. What's behind this accusation of being an apartheid state? Now I want to give you a few facts about Israel, and I give you these facts as someone who's been traveling to Israel for over 40 years. And so I can attest that 20% of Israel's population are Arab. Almost 25% of Israel's population are not Jewish, but roughly 20% are actually of Arab descent. Most of them are Muslim and there is a minority, a Christian minority. Now, so Israel's Arab citizens are a minority. Right here, I wanna stop, and I wanna to explain to you something that is extremely important for you to understand. When we talk about Israel's treatments of the Arabs, we have to understand, and this is something the Amnesty International Report completely mixed up and got wrong and didn't understand this differential. They didn't want to understand. There are two main blocks of Arabs that are the concern here. One are the Israeli Arabs, which are citizens of Israel, and that is roughly 20% of Israel's population are Israeli Arabs. They have Israeli passports, they hold Israeli citizenship, and they are afforded all the rights of an Israeli citizen. There is absolutely no apartheid there, and I will give you a few statistics in a minute. But there's another group of Arabs, and these are the Palestinian Arabs that live in the areas under the Palestinian Authority government, areas that are a part of, have historically been a part of Israel. But in the 90s, Israel began a peace process called the Oslo Peace Process. And in this peace process, they actually set up a Palestinian government over the main population centers so that the Palestinian people were living under the authority of a Palestinian government. They didn't have all the land and all the territories in the West Bank, what we call the West Bank, um, but the, the population centers are all under the Palestinian Authority government. So they are not Israeli citizens. They are in a bit of a state of flux because their leaders will not negotiate peace with Israel, have not negotiated peace with Israel. So they're not a full-fledged state. They don't have citizenship. 
And so this is the other group of Arabs. So most of the accusations against Israel are about the Palestinian Arabs. But because a lot of people mix this up, they don't really give a fair treatment of the subject. So let's take it one by one. Israeli Arabs that are Israeli citizens living in Israel proper, they, have, they are full citizens. They vote. They have their own political parties. Right now, a, an Arab party is a part of the governing coalition in the government of Israel. There are Israeli Arabs that serve in the Israeli Foreign uh, Service. They serve as diplomats and as, as um, ambassadors even. There are Israeli Arabs serving in um, the IDF. They're, they can volunteer for it, but they're not required to serve in the army. But a lot of them volunteer to serve in the border patrol, which is a, like a police, a border police. Um, there has been an Israeli Arab that was Miss Israel one year. There is an Israeli Arab serving in the Supreme Court as a Supreme Court justice. There are Israeli Arabs that are major uh, athletic stars in Israel. There are actors and actresses that are Israeli Arabs. There are singers. There, you got to understand, they have achieved so much in Israel that there is a move now amongst the Arab citizens of Israel to serve in the army because they understand the freedoms that they have that even in the other Arab countries they wouldn't have, and they want to protect those freedoms. So they are now volunteering to serve in the Israeli army. Those are Israeli Arabs. Absolutely no racism, no apartheid. Now, I will say this. The Israeli Arab minority in Israel has a special challenge, unlike most minorities in other countries. Okay, Every country has its minorities, and every minority struggles to have full rights. It's just a part of life. But the Israeli Arab minority has an extra little challenge that they have to overcome, and that is the security challenge. They are part of an ethnicity and a language group that all the surrounding countries share who are, have been the enemies of Israel. Some are still at a state of war with Israel. And so this Israeli Arab population um, sometimes come under undue suspicion. But it is also true that there are efforts by ISIS and other radical Islamic groups to radicalize Israeli Arabs through the mosque. And so just recently, there were several terrorist attacks carried out by Israeli Arabs. This is, in a way, kind of a, a new development. It's a problem that Israel's keeping their eyes on, but it's because of outside forces radicalizing on the inside of Israel. Now let's talk about the Palestinian Arabs that are in the West Bank, and then we'll talk about the Palestinians that are in Gaza, two slightly different situations. In the West Bank, they are under the Palestinian Authority government, and this government has uh, pocketed billions of dollars that was sent to aid the Palestinian people. If you go to their capital city of Ramallah, you will see great affluency, many huge mansions, shopping centers. Um, there is so much money that has been invested in the Palestinians that you'll see there amongst the government leaders and the government circles. But the terrible thing, the travesty is that this Palestinian government has still kept Palestinian refugee camps in place in their territory. So there are Palestinians living as refugees with very high poverty level, with very high unemployment levels within the Palestinian territory. So you explain that to me. Is that Israel's fault? Absolutely not. But do they blame Israel? Every single time. Now, we have a third group of Arabs, and those are the Palestinians living in Gaza. The reason they're a little different is because 
they overthrew the Palestinian Authority government and they put into place a terrorist organization as their government, and that is Hamas. So all of the money that has been flowing into Gaza, which is supposed to be helping the people, has been spent by Hamas at buying weapons, at building underground bunkers and tunnels, and making plans to defeat and to destroy Israel. They don't care about the betterment of their people. It's a very, very sad situation there in Gaza. Most of the Palestinians living in Gaza would like to leave Gaza. Um, but is that Israel's fault? And the answer is no. It is Hamas's fault. They've been given every opportunity to build a life for their, their people. Do you know Gaza is on the Mediterranean coastline. When Israel had Gaza under their control, they had beautiful farms and uh, um, greenhouses, and they were growing produce and shipping it out around the world. When they abandoned those fields and the hot houses and moved out uh, in 2005, Israel moved out and turned it over to the Palestinians. You know what they did? They went in and destroyed the farms and destroyed the um, greenhouses and completely destroyed any opportunity of building that same industry for themselves. So this is what I'm saying. They could have built a Singapore on the Mediterranean coast. They could have built a Hong Kong on the Mediterranean coast. It would be a beautiful luxury resort place. But no, they have to put all their money into building underground tunnels and rocket launchers and rockets so that they can terrorize the people of Israel and launch rockets at them. So this is the situation of Israel and the Arabs. So I want you to know that you can support Israel without any hesitation. Israel is not racist. They are not apartheid. They do have security concerns, um, but we would do the same if we had the same security concerns that they have. Now, as I bring today to a close, I just want to add one little note to our Christian audience about supporting Israel and about being concerned for the Arabs. You know, God loves the Arab people, and we as Christians should be concerned for the welfare of the Arabs, whether they're Israeli Arabs, they are Palestinian Arabs, or they are living in Gaza. We should pray for them. We should advocate for them to be freed of these, uh, especially in Gaza, to be freed of this terrorist government. We should pray for the Palestinians in the West Bank that they would have leaders that are brave enough to come to the negotiating table and negotiate a deal with Israel. And um, we need to pray for their betterment, but make sure that we put blame where blame is due and we don't demonize the people of Israel by blaming them for something that is not really their fault. So that brings to a close today's teaching on Israel. Uh, is it a racist apartheid state? I want to um, close by offering you uh, two little offers. Stay tuned. Well, hey, give me one more minute. I have two very special offers for you. First is all you ladies out there, we have scheduled a women's tour to Israel this November November 2nd through the 12th. I invite you to go with me to the land of the Bible. Let's walk the land. Let's talk the Bible. Let's have our faith restored and ignited and strengthened for the days in which we live. To sign up, I want you to go down below into today's show notes and sign up for our tour interest list. We will send you all the information. Or if it's easier, just call our tours department line at 866-393-5890. That's 866-393-5890. I want to travel Israel with you. Now, my second offer is a free download that we have developed just for you called 10 Reasons 
for Christians to support Israel. Over the coming weeks, I'm going to be talking about a lot of these reasons, but I want you to have this download so that you can be preparing yourself, that you can share it with your friends and colleagues and invite them to listen in each week as I will be going over some of these reasons and going a little bit farther into depth. So in today's show notes, we link directly to this downloadable 10 Reasons Why Christians Should Support Israel. Or you can go to the outofzionshow.com landing page, click on Resources, and we should have a link there for you as well. So take advantage of this free download, and I will see you back here next week, fully informed, ready to learn some more. Until then, God bless. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Out of Zion with Susan Michael. Be sure to subscribe to Out of Zion now on Apple Podcasts, cpnshows.com, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen and learn. Out of Zion with Susan Michael is a production of ICEJ USA, all rights reserved.